tonight, trucking down the highway. Out of a job elsewhere, thousands take to trucking and the lure of the open road. But are they ready to be semi-tough? They're gonna give you the keys and you're gonna start driving. But I don't know how to drive. I never drove before. I only drove around the block. Plus, this man speaks out for the first time about safety and his experiences training trucker wannabes. There are a lot of good, productive, solid people out there driving trucks, but there are also a lot of people who come to truck driving because it's their last resort. If it wasn't for the truck, they would be homeless. Good evening. Tonight, an investigation into truckers and who's training them to drive big rigs. Every year, tens of thousands of new truckers hit the road. And you might not know it, but those rigs you pass on the highway can weigh up to 80,000 pounds or more than 20 cars. So you would hope that whoever's in command of the 18-wheeler is an experienced, well-trained driver. Our reporting has found that many times that is not the case. A continual driver shortage has led companies to recruit and employ a wide range of candidates, all sorts of people you'd never expect. Former factory workers and bankers, retirees and housewives, allured with promises of free training, a steady paycheck, and a chance for a new life on the open road. Trucking was once a domain ruled by a cavalry of boot-kicking, jerky-chewing Marlboro men. You didn't used to see too many women manhandling the innards of a big rig. Ah, oh, there it is. I got a pink toolbox on principle because people try to make it seem like you have to be really, really, really tough to do it, operate a truck safely, and that's just not true. <laughs> There are now some 200,000 lady long-haul drivers out on the road. Desiree Wood is one of the new breed. I like to be casual. I didn't really particularly want to wear pantyhose anywhere. <laughs> I know that kind of sounds like a weird reason to be a trucker. A 45-year-old single mom who admits she's had her share of hard knocks. She never gave one iota of thought to trucking until two years ago. All at once, her relationship turned sour, her career path hit a pothole, and her cash flow dried up. So she set out to find a new route in life. In my 20s and 30s, I took a lot of cross-country road trips with my dogs and my friends. It seemed like when we got to the other side of the country, I was like, you know what? What if they were on a road trip forever? The open road has always lured its share of dreamers. And with the trucking industry's chronic driver shortage, it was an easy match for Desiree Wood. The first step was to learn how to drive the semis and to get a commercial driver's license. There are hundreds of truck driving schools across the country that offer everything from weeks of behind the wheel training to a quick web tutorial. Desiree Wood chose a three-week course offered by the CDL School in Miami. Are you in a dead-end job and looking for a new career? Would you like to double your salary in just three weeks? Then the CDL School is just what you are looking for. Truck driver training has proven to be in continuous demand. Even in this economy, trucking schools across the country are reporting spikes in applications. Refugees from the recession, transplants from cubicles, and people like Desiree Wood, who are simply looking for a fresh start. So how did you wind up choosing to go to trucking school? Seems an odd choice. I mostly did not want to work in an office. I wanted to go somewhere where I was gonna do my job and be left alone. But here at the Miami campus of the CDL school, Wood says she didn't expect to be left alone quite so much. She says she paid more than $5,500 and she wanted to learn how to drive a truck. Instead, she says, 
She spent most of the time crushing cones on the driving course. Well, did you have a lot of driving practice? Did they get, give you a lot of driving school experience? No. They, uh, my school, we, we got our, our written part out of the way the first week. Then we go to the driving course. And basically, they would drop us off there, and they'd be like, there's the trucks. We'll pick you up at 7. Well, surely you had a, <laughs> had a driving instructor set second seat with you or something. They had a guy that would come and get us in, like, groups of five, and he would take us around the block, kind of, and we'd all get a chance to drive, like, a mile, and then the other four of us would be sitting in the back seat. And he would actually shift for us. And um, he would, you know, tell us, you know, one, two, to do the double clutching, one, two. Before you went to this driving school, do you know what double clutch was? <laughs> I never heard of it. Wood says she discovered pretty quickly that the ABCs of trucking are not as easy as SUV. Driving a tractor trailer rig is not like driving a car. Jerry Donaldson is the research director of a watchdog group based in Washington, D.C., called advocates for highway and auto safety. It is very crucial to learn exactly how to control your speeds in relationship to what gear you're in, to handle the truck going around curves, and an inexperienced driver only needs to make one crucial mistake, and the death and injury toll will be very high. Nearly 5,000 people on average each year are killed in crashes involving big trucks. Nobody knows how many of those involve rookie truckers, but piloting a 75-foot, fully loaded rig at high speeds is not the kind of thing Desiree Wood thinks you can learn on a driving course. But at the CDL school in Miami, she says, actual road time was very limited. In three weeks, she says she drove the student truck on the street only twice. I only got two times. You're supposed to go three, but the last day I was like begging. I'm like, I haven't gone out very much. Can I go? Well, you know that a lot of people will hear this and say, you mean to tell me she went to what is supposed to be trucking school and she actually only drove the truck more or less around the block? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, what do we think of that? Uh, it's unsafe. Safe or not, it's neither unusual nor illegal, according to Jerry Donaldson. The states don't require any training. The federal government requires no training. There are many trucking training facilities out there which are nothing more than certificate mills. As it stands, he says, training for new truckers is purely optional and the testing is often a crapshoot. In Florida, for example, there are more than 40 third-party outfits certified to administer state exams, including the CDL school in Miami. That was where Desiree Wood says she took her test. I went on my final driving test in an automatic. And so I didn't have to worry about shifting. I just had to worry about not hitting any corners. Well, do you think or not that new drivers who've gotten their CDL, a commercial driver's license, when they start driving, are they really ready to drive a big rig, what, 80,000 pounds on the highway? No. They're not. I mean, they, they're putting these people out on the highway that some of them are inappropriate to ever sit in this seat, and they're pushing them through these schools. It's until a business. They, yes, it's a business. It's an industry in itself, these students. The student trucking business is booming at the CDL school. The owner declined repeated requests for an interview, but the video on the company's website spells out the perks. The CDL school offers intensive hands-on and classroom training in our fully equipped facilities. Our goal is to help you improve your future and obtain a solid career in one of the fastest growing job markets in the, the U.S. The CDL school did put Desiree Wood on the fast track. In just three weeks, she'd earned a commercial driver's license and landed a job with a major trucking company. Ready or not, she headed up to orientation. I felt like I really did not learn enough to go off to a company. I knew I was going to go to a company in three days and be driving in the winter as a real truck driver. You know, I, this, I didn't get into this so that I could die. Desiree Wood. Now, straight ahead, a man who trained rookies speaks out for the first time about who's behind the wheel of some of those big rigs.
Missed an edition of Dan Rather Reports? Or just want to see one again? We're now available on iTunes. So check us out. In recent years, federal investigators uncovered CDL fraud schemes in nearly two dozen states that involved more than 16,000 truckers licensed through illegitimate means. The most notorious probe led to the downfall of George Ryan, the former governor of Illinois. Ryan's underlings were taking bribes from CDL schools in exchange for issuing licenses to unqualified truckers. Safety experts think it's still a widespread problem. Not so, according to the American Trucking Associations, which represents more than 37,000 trucking carriers across the country. If a state is licensing a person who can't operate a truck safely, shame on the state. Dave Oshaki is vice president of safety for the ATA. After a long day of meetings at the association's annual conference in Las Vegas, he carved out time to answer our questions. The circumstance where a person can go and take a one hour, two hour, eight hour training course, operate a truck around the block and then go pass a test, that's a problem in oversight. Oshaki says the training and testing misadventures Desiree Wood describes are unusual. And he says new drivers are typically hired by companies that have special on-the-job training programs of their own known as finishing schools. Some companies have these finishing programs where they're willing to take on the risk because they're willing to finish the, the driver's training and get them some experience in a, in a lower risk environment. Lower risk, he says, because rookies are sent out on team trucks with trainers or co-drivers who are supposed to show them the ropes. One of the industry's biggest training companies is CRST Van Expedited. When I see a truck from a former company I worked for, I give them a lot of space because I'm not so sure of that person's skills. Until very recently, Tom Hansen worked as a manager here at CRST's terminal in Oklahoma City. Every Monday morning for five years, Hansen says, he got 30 to 40 new recruits who he put through a battery of checks and tests to ensure they qualified for CRST's finishing school. When this brand new student got there, did they pass the qualifications that we gave them? Could they write their name more than once? Could they read a map? Could they pass a road test without hitting four curbs or being able to shift the truck? Hansen is speaking out for the first time tonight. He says many of the rookies were finished before finishing school. I know from personal experience doing thousands of road tests, at least in the last seven years, literally thousands, that's not an exaggeration. Um, there's a lot of them who probably shouldn't be doing this business. They probably should stick to maybe, you know, drywalling or roofing or whatever they were doing in the past. All of the new recruits had already earned their commercial driver's licenses and were days away from crisscrossing the country in loaded semis. So Hansen says CRST's road test, which consisted of a total of about three miles and four right turns, should not have been a problem. But Hansen says even with two tries, typically at least 10% of every class failed and got sent home. I, I felt good about having a 10% failure rate. That means that those 10 out of 100 people that I was keeping out of the trucks we're not going to be out there where my mother or my daughter or my son are out on the roads. But Hansen says sending so many new hires packing was expensive because CRST had already paid for their orientation expenses and often the tuition for their CDL schools. The company decided that the cost per hire was getting too high, so we need to change what are you doing wrong, meaning me. Um, my road test was too hard. Change your road test. Hansen says that his three-mile test route was reduced to about three-quarters of a mile, including just two right turns. And the new recruits, he says, were still failing. Uh, they'd hit a curb leaving the yard, or they'd hit a curb turning into the truck stop. Uh, they wouldn't be able to shift. They'd stall out multiple times trying to take off at one of the stoplights. Um, I had one lady about three weeks ago that just stood up in the middle of the street and said, I can't do this. 
Um, I had to take over the truck right away. Um, it, was, it, it got pretty frustrating, even on such a short road test. CRST declined multiple requests for an interview. But in documents filed with federal regulators, the company says its finishing school is a vital part of its team business model. It says that while experienced drivers do not wish to run in a team, rookies are willing to work on team trucks. In other words, live cheek to jowl with a stranger 24-7. That means the company can run trucks longer, move freight faster, and earn more money. According to CRST's filing, of the 5,400 new drivers the company hired in 2007, nearly 70 percent were students. Desiree Wood was still a student at the CDL school in Miami when she landed a job with another training company called Covenant Transport. I just remember that first week. I was like, you don't even really have a good gauge of where is this thing staying between the lanes. Nobody teaches you that. Week one, all the new hires were assigned trainers, Covenant's senior co-drivers who, according to her company handbook, are expected to be, quote, the safest, best trained, best equipped drivers possible. They tell you right in the orientation, your trainer's probably gonna show up, they've been driving all night, they're tired, so you should expect that they're gonna give you the keys and you're gonna start driving. So all, everybody's like, <laughs> but I don't know how to drive. I never drove before. I only drove around the block. Over at CRST, the story of one driver and his trainer has become the stuff of trucking legend. Except this is no legend, it's true. The student was behind the wheel and couldn't wake his lead driver up, so he drove all the way to Santa Rosa, parked for the night, couldn't get his lead driver up the next morning and drove into Oklahoma City. Walked up to me and, me and a friend who was a safety trainer at the time and said, I want a new lead driver, my lead driver won't wake up. So my friend John walks out to the truck and he comes back with this really funny look on his face and says, man, that dude ain't sleeping, he's dead. That is an absolutely true story. Drove through three states with his lead driver dead in the bunk and didn't realize it. The coroner determined that the lead driver died of natural causes. But in a way, the 48-year-old man was also a casualty of the long haul life. The demands can be brutal. The stress harrowing. At one time, CRST required trainers to have at least eight months of driving experience, Hansen says, but when there weren't enough trainers, he says the company decided to change the standards. All of a sudden, we are allowing people with a, exactly six months of experience, might have had an incident their first two months of driving, maybe had an out-of-service violation, and we're approving them for lead drive. CRST did give us a written statement in which the company says all trainers are experienced drivers who must also complete an additional CRST training program, which includes both written examinations and road tests. While the company writes that it's, quote, proud of its driver training program, Hansen says his experience tells him something else. You know what I say, stay off the sidewalks. Desiree Wood says at her company, Covenant Transport, she was also nervous, especially when she surveyed the field of co-drivers with whom she'd be partnering. The first day of orientation was like a who's who of, of criminal activity. Oh yeah, I just got out of this for this, and I got off that for this, and I'm just sitting there going. They seriously do not let people who just got out of jail just get on trucks with somebody like, you know, Silly Sally. Here, here's the keys to a truck and a gas card. See you later. Go take our million dollars of freight and have a good time. Just make sure you get there on Monday, okay? There are a lot of good, productive, solid people out there driving trucks. Salt of the earth. Some of my best friends are truck drivers, people that I would trust my life to. But there are also a lot of people who come to truck driving because it's their last resort. They failed at everything else they ever did. They no longer have a credit rating. If it wasn't for the truck, they would be homeless. Many, he says are not just down on their luck. I have personally taken away pot pipes. I found marijuana in the men's restroom at the terminal I worked at. Um, I took a crack pipe away from um, 
driver. I have caught people drunk on duty. Hansen says he prided himself on convincing new recruits to come clean about criminal records and substance abuse problems. Until a few months ago, when he says the company told him he was weeding out too many new recruits. Once again, the numbers were affecting the the playing field, I guess you could say. They told me, ease up on the honesty speech, quit doing it. So that's exactly what I did. CRST wrote that 100% of new hires are drug tested and that any driver who fails is immediately terminated. They say the company's hiring standards and background checks exceed all federal standards for professional truck drivers. At Covenant, Desiree Wood says her co-drivers weren't up to her standards, regardless of the company's. When you're a student and you're in a team, you have to share the bottom bunk. Nobody's allowed to be on the top while the truck is moving. And a team truck runs 24 hours a day. So you're basically sleeping in the same bed as somebody that you just met. Well, I was on a truck with somebody that used to be in prison for attempted murder and a former drug trafficker. I'm all for people changing their life and moving on, but I shouldn't have to live with them in here. I'm not Dr. Phil. During finishing school, Desiree Wood says she had all sorts of co-drivers and all sorts of experiences that didn't make it into the recruiting videos. But Wood says she was shocked to find out that Covenant had approved one particular co-driver to become a trainer. We ended up getting to the desert and he told me that I was a racist because I wouldn't have sex with him. That's kind of a thing with some of the male trainers is that they you know, they got, you got a captive audience. They get you 2,000 miles from home and they're like, you're not gonna pass unless you do me. You're not making this up. No, no, and, it, and it's common knowledge. Wood says that she took a lot of notes and that she filed repeated complaints detailing everything from a pill-popping co-driver to being asked to falsify logs to having her and her belongings tossed from a cab. She says she pushed the company to remove her from several team trucks. Covenant declined our repeated interview requests, but in a written statement, the company says its safety program is a, quote, nationally recognized model of excellence. The company also says Covenant is a, quote, leading provider of career opportunities for women truckers who make up 17% of its driver workforce. Covenant also told us that the company has received and investigated some of Desiree Wood's allegations, but they say they are, quote, prohibited from discussing personnel matters. Women are breaking into the big rig business, but some say it's a rough road. Tom Hansen's former company, CRST, was the target of a class action lawsuit filed in 2007 by the Federal Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. That suit involved 270 women drivers who accused their male counterparts of dozens of acts, including propositions for sex, brushing up, crawling into women's bunks uninvited, punching, kicking, grabbing, fondling, and rape. Tom Hansen says he testified in a deposition on behalf of CRST. The point of the lawsuit was to show that the management of the company had uh, condoned it, didn't make any effort to stop it. And from a, being a manager, I know that wasn't true. I had no problems standing in front of the EOC and saying we did our very best. Good enough to beat the EEOC, the company won. This summer, the court dismissed the case ruling that the EEOC had failed to prove it was CRST's standard operating procedure to tolerate sexual harassment, meaning they lacked enough evidence for a class action suit. The court also blasted the agency because its legal missteps meant possibly dozens of potentially meritorious sexual harassment claims may now never see the inside of a courtroom. Hansen says he thinks there were clear problems that put a lot of women in troubling situations. There is nothing that says you can't hire an ex-felon, okay? When you're trying to fill a truck, especially during a driver shortage, you're going to take what you can get. <clears throat> now, with good common sense, I should say, don't pair them up with a female. Don't, you know, don't let them train a female. 
But once again, that's, that's upper management's responsibility. Here's the problem I saw at my former company. The head of the safety department, who normally approves whether a person can come to work with felonies or convictions or whatever, is also the head of the recruiting department. So it's a huge conflict of interest. The guy who's running the department that says, no, we don't want him, is also the guy that's responsible for producing the numbers. Same person. CRST wrote us that Hansen is an obviously disgruntled former employee. You could call me a disgruntled worker, but I'm not disgruntled. I'm disenchanted. I'm disheartened by what I've seen, you know, some pluses and some minuses. A lot more minuses than pluses. And in September, after seven years at CRST and four other trucking companies before that, Hansen also decided it was time for him to take his leave. I wanted to make transportation my profession. I wanted to be a transportation professional. I used to have my resume labeled transportation professional. I no longer want to be in the transportation business. You are all the time weighing my life, my paycheck, my life, my paycheck. I gotta pay my bills, but I, you know what I mean? If I don't have a paycheck, I don't have a life. During finishing school, Desiree Wood was earning 14 cents a mile which meant she was typically bringing in no more than $300 a week before expenses. I can live on a sandwich, but I was always thinking about these young men. They've got a whole bunch of responsibilities and they're barely making ends meet and that's how they got into this in the first place. They are at the end of the line that they had to tell their wife, I'm gonna go away and I'm gonna live in a truck and I'm gonna send all the money home so that we can save the house or the car or whatever it is. That's when you get these meltdowns. You know, somebody's in Wyoming in a snowstorm and they just totally lose it. They, got, they worked all week and the paycheck comes and it's got all these deductions and they got $40. These people do not know what they're getting themselves into before they get there. All they know are the stories that were told to them by the truck driving schools, the instructors. Then they get there and they realize they're not making very much money. They're living in that truck 24 hours a day. The, the hygiene standards are very low. You might not get to take a shower, but once every couple days. Um, they have to spend a lot of money just to live out on the road. People are rude to them. So the turnover rate is very high. For every 100 new drivers hired, a recent study funded by an industry organization found an astounding 97 were no longer on the company's payroll a year later. Uh, from a safety standpoint, uh, it is, it's a challenge. Uh, a stable work workforce is typically a very safe workforce. ATA's Vice President of Safety, Dave Oshaki, says that no company wants to be a revolving door. The fleets that we represent spend a lot of time trying to reduce driver turnover because it, it does cost money. When you, when you have pe drivers turning over, it is a cost of doing business, but it's also a safety concern. So they spend a lot of time trying to reduce those numbers. While turnover, especially among the rookies, is cause for concern, Oshaki says that data doesn't lie and the data shows trucking's never been safer. Because he says while thousands die, the numbers are declining safety advocate Jerry Donaldson. If it's safe as it's ever been, then it isn't a very good story because it's not very safe. We've averaged about 5,000 deaths over the past decade. Those numbers have not significantly changed in many years. Um, the fatal crash rate is still the highest of any type of surface transportation. So unfortunately, the same disproportionate impact on human lives and suffering is the same now as it has been for many years. As for Desiree Wood, she says that most of the students she began with are long gone. And these days, the only one she has to share her truck with is her dog, Karma. Day to day, what's life like for you? Just get up early, drive, hope to get a good parking spot. I mean, that's like, you, you, um, you appreciate simple pleasures like uh, going into a public restroom and finding they have hot water and not just cold water to wash your face. All those little little simple pleasures you that you take for granted, like when you wake up in the morning and you go have to use the restroom, I have to walk through a parking lot. And if it's snowing outside, I gotta walk through the snow. Being one of the few to defy the odds and survive the torment of what she calls the student trucking industry, 
has armed Wood with a new resolve. She did not suffer quietly. Desiree went public with her story, tapping out a detailed account of what she says it really takes to make it on that river of rigs, churning across America's highways. It appears in a series of web posts she calls a day in the life of a lady trucker. Well, you know that old saying is some days you're the windshield and some days you're the bug. <laughs> when you're driving the truck, what do you feel? Oh, I feel like I'm the I, <laughs> I'm not the bug, not anymore. <laughs> not anymore, I'm not the bug. Her tales attracted a cult-like following, and today, trucker Desiree has become somewhat of a virtual trucking star. Somewhere on a highway last December, she wrote in her blog, It's taken me a year to be able to start making a life out here. I love it because I like to go places. I don't care where. I think it's a very important time for truckers to let the outside world have a glimpse inside this private, misunderstood world. Let's all go for a ride now. Life on the road. Now there's so much more to the trucking story, especially what the powerful trucking lobby is doing in Washington to increase the industry's bottom line. We here on Dan Rather Reports will have that story in the coming weeks.